right, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Camila Foreman, and I'm the Director of Publications at DIA, and I am truly delighted to welcome you all to the inaugural event in our series that we have dubbed Poetry And. So for those of you who don't know, um, DIA's artistic remit extends beyond the visual art that you see on our walls and our galleries here in Beacon, down at DIA Chelsea, out at DIA Bridgehampton, as well as our various artist sites across the United States and Europe. It also um, includes dance, sound, the literary arts, and especially poetry. And interestingly enough, in 1987 is when we first started doing pub uh, poetry programs at DIA. And so for almost 25 years, poetry has been the longest running public program series of events that we, we do. Um, moving a little bit further in our timeline, in 2020, we came together and decided to sort of rethink how we engaged with poetry and with poets. And so we invited the acclaimed poet, Jose Olivares, to help us curate a new series. Um, and what we came up with is Poetry And. And so the idea is that, I guess to borrow a theater metaphor, um, we take a yes and approach to, to poetry. So whether it's events like today with the Worker Writer School, who, as we'll hear later, um, already had a really interesting connection between the power of the, of the written word and a desire to manifest and present this wor um, their work visually in a very different way, or to future programs that we'll have where we'll pair a poet with an artist in another medium, you know, we ground things in poetry and use that as a base to, to, to help poets realize how to express their work in a different way and hopefully give audiences a very different experience that breaks out of the very traditional reading format. Um, and I guess now I should introduce Jose. So Jose Olivares is the son of Mexican immigrants. His debut book of poems, Citizen Illegal, was a finalist for the Penn Jean Stein Award and a winner of the 2018 Chicago Review of Books Poetry Prize. And I guess, time out for a second. Um, Citizen Illegal is one of those books that like, I bought it, I loved it, and I had to give it to a friend. And so I had to go buy another copy, and then I had to give it to another friend, and then I had to buy another copy, and then give it to another friend. And I highly recommend that you buy it, and you may not turn into a solo very much nonprofit distribution entity, but it is the type of book that you that you want to buy four times. Um, Citizen Legal was also named a top book of 2018 by the Adroit Journal, NPR, and the New York Public Library. Along with Felicia Chavez and Willie Perdomo, he co-edited the poetry anthology, The Breakbeat Poets, Volume 4, Latin Next. He's the co-host of the podcast, The Poetry Gods. In 2018, he was awarded the first annual Author and Artist in Justice Award from the Phillips Brook House Association and named a debut poet of 2018 by Poets and Writers Magazine. In 2019, he was awarded a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Paris Review, and elsewhere. Please um, help me welcome Jose Olivares. Hey, what's going on, everyone? My name is Jose Guadalupe Olivares. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I want to say a couple things about this series. One is that when we were imagining what it might look like to do poetry readings uh, during the coronavirus pandemic and beyond the pandemic, um, we imagined kind of breaking some of the traditional roles that are established at poetry readings. So the usual roles at poetry readings are ones where, uh, you know, the roles are very stagnant. The poets are the ones speaking and the audience is just there to receive. And in some ways, um, what makes so much sense about this particular collaboration with the Worker Writer School is that, uh, you know, I think we want to believe that art is for everyone and that everyone can inhabit all of the roles, right? So there's not 
necessarily a distinction between who gets to make art and who gets to receive art. We can kind of shift and be in all of those roles, right? Uh, and so uh, with all of that said, um, I want to welcome you to our first reading. Uh, raise your hand if this is your first time going to a poetry reading. Anybody new to this? All right, a couple people, cool. Bienvenidos. If you are not new to this, welcome back. Uh, a couple things you should know. Some of the walls in the museum, it says things like, do not touch the art. You know, sometimes we feel like we have to be very quiet. Some people think poetry is a very like brittle art form where if you speak too loudly, something might break. But I believe that poetry is communal. And so you are encouraged to react in whatever ways you want to react. Uh, so we can practice that for a second. So if you want to, you can snap your fingers. Let me see you snap your fingers. Yes, very good. That's kind of like the timeless classic response. You can clap your hands. Let me hear you clap your hands. That's very polite. That sounded like a golf clap. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, make yourselves at home. I'm so delighted and proud of the presentation that we have for you today. There'll be time at the end for a Q&A, so if you have questions, please make note of them and we'll make time at the end to talk. Um, I wanted to read a little bit about uh, the coronavirus haiku, which is primarily what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, and it's this book here. It's available for sale today, so you should get a copy. But in the introduction, uh, Mark Nowak writes, the poems published here stand as a testament to the effects of COVID-19 on the essential workers who have risked their lives to save ours. Yet this volume also stands as testimony to the freedom dreams of these same essential workers in the city that first felt the tidal wave of the virus. Um, so I'm so excited for you to become more acquainted with these poets, with these poems, with this project that, like Mark says, um, reminds us of all of the textures of that word, essential worker, which kind of took on new life in the last couple of years, right? And reminds us also of the freedom dreams, right? The dreams that are contained in that, in that kind of history, in that world that we're trying to create and inhabit. Um, so with all of that being said, I'm excited to welcome uh, Mark Nowak to the stage to introduce our two poets for the, for the afternoon. And thank you all so much for being here and joining us, we'll hope. That, uh, that you stick around and that uh, you have a chance to converse with us. So please give it up for Mark. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Wait, try again. Good afternoon, everybody. There we go. Uh, so, I'm so happy to be here uh, at DIA, be back here at DIA. I wanted to thank uh, Camila and Jose uh, for, for making all this possible, really. Uh, we're, we're super excited to be here. The Worker Writer School is an idea I had uh, probably about 15 or 17 years ago. I had been, uh, for a very long time, since the late 1980s, teaching poetry in the schools, poetry in the prisons. Uh, but I grew up in a working class family in Buffalo, New York. Uh, my dad worked in a factory like this used to be. Uh, his parents, my mother's parents, everybody worked in factories. Um, and I felt like this thing I was doing in the schools and this thing I was doing uh, teaching in the prisons, like I wanted to know why no one had really thought probably really since about the 1930s and the WPA to, to work with working class organizations. Uh, so I was living in, uh, the very first one I did was in Chicago with, uh, with the Teamsters and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and it was a really great workshop and reading. Then I was living in St. Paul, Minnesota and a Ford plant was closing and I had been working with the UAW uh, on some different things and told them uh, what if we did a poetry workshop with the workers in between shifts and workers at the Ford plant met, wrote poems, we had events. 
Uh, I went and took their poems to Ford plants in Pretoria and Port Elizabeth, South Africa, and did workshops in those plants, setting up a dot worker to worker dialogue uh, between workers in the US and workers in South Africa and elsewhere. And when I moved back to New York and New York City, uh, Penn, uh, a staff person from Penn America approached me and said, do you feel like doing something like this? Uh, and I was like, Sure, like, let's do it. And the organization I first approached and the person I first met is one of tonight's leaders, readers, uh, the leader of Domestic Workers United, Secretary, uh, Cultural Outreach Coordinator, Christine Lewis, and she'll be our second reader today. Um, but we've been meeting, COVID happened, we've been meeting for 10 years in New York City. Christine has been attending creative writing workshops for 10 years at Pan America. I think she should have a PhD, honorary PhD in literature by that point in time. So if you know anybody who gives those out, uh, come talk to me, we'll work on it. Uh, and in March of 2020, uh, we meet the first Saturday of every month. And so that was the first Saturday in March of 2020. That was when news of the coronavirus pandemic was just starting to get in the news. Remember, it was in White Plains, that's where I work, right? I teach in White Plains, and I was like, what? And then there was the cruise ship, and there were a couple cases, and we met, we met in person that day. We thought all we had to do was wash our hands a lot at that point in time, remember, and polish our canned goods when they came in the house. And so we met, and instead of, we always hug each other, right? I miss hugging both of you today, by the way. And so we would hug each other when we start our workshop, and this time instead I had this big bottle of hand sanitizer, and I stood at the door, and when people came in, we hand sanitized. And I was walking to workshop that day, and I had a whole different lesson planned. And as I was walking, I was saying this word over in my head, coronavirus, right? Coronavirus. It was brand new. Coronavirus, coronavirus. And I realized coronavirus had five syllables, right? And the Japanese poetic form, the haiku, is a poem five syllables in the first line, seven syllables in the second line, five syllables in the third line. And so when I got to workshop, I scrapped the old plan and I took out this new plan. I said, we've got this thing moving around, right? It's in White Plains, it's on a cruise ship. There are a couple cases in New York. How is coronavirus affecting our lives in the first week of March, right? That's before the great toilet paper shortages and everything else happened, right? And we wrote haiku that day and we said goodbye to each other. And then like a flood wave of COVID washed across New York City, right? And washed across everywhere. So a month later, the first Saturday of April, I said to everyone, let's still meet. There's this new thing called Zoom, right? And that doesn't feel new to most of us anymore, right? This new thing called Zoom, what if we met and we'll just say hello to each other, if nothing else, and we'll maybe try to write a poem, and maybe we'll try to write another haiku. And everybody was so happy to just see each other in the workshop and say hello and write a little bit, to be a little bit social in this very asocial time that we just started meeting every other week, in fact, and we kept writing haiku, which have resulted in this book called Coronavirus Haiku by our members. And so the first member to read today, a uh, fabulous poet who I have to say is, I think, writing a haiku a day since we started, uh, must have 500 of them by this point in time. Lorraine Garnett is a nanny in Brooklyn. She has previously worked as a preschool teacher after school supervisor, summer camp activities director. Her poems are forthcoming in several anthologies. I think one of them is out now. Uh, Good Cop, Bad Cop from Flower Song Press and I Can't Breathe, Poetic Anthology of Fresh Air. She's read her poems at venues including the Workers United Film Festival, Burl's Poetry Bookshop in Brooklyn, the Crush Reading Series at Woodbine and the Penn World Voices Festival. Born and raised in Jamaica, Garnett currently lives in Brooklyn. Please put your hands together for Lorraine Garnett. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I am Lorraine Garnett, and I am psyched to be here. I'm so happy. First of all, I just want to say thank you to um, the museum for having us here. This is just really wonderful. 
Thank you to Mark for, I mean, without Mark Noak, we would not be here. Mark is, um, we just need more of Mark. I don't even know how to say that. But Mark um, instilling us that we all can write. And as Jose was saying earlier on, that writing and the art is for everyone. It's for everyone. So um, Mark really instilled in us that you can write. And I started, I've been with the Workers' Writers Group for four years. I started, I saw it was a, a flyer, was doing a workshop for, uh, workshop for Nanny. And Mark was the um, instructor at the time and invited me to the Workers' Writers School. And it's one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. I feel important. I don't know how to explain that to you, but I really do. And, um, and with the Workers' Writers School, we were doing the tanker before, which um, is just two extra lines. And we really, the group got into that because Mark is so phenomenal. He lets you do the work by just whatever magic work. Just look out the window and then there's a poem right there by him just saying, just look out the window. What did you see today on your way coming? I mean, I am lost for words. But um, yeah, so I'm going to read, because Mark would say talk less and read more. So <laughs> I'm going to read some of the haiku from, and, and Christine is here with us, and Christine is phenomenal, a storyteller. We all love Christine. Hi, Christine. <laughs> yes, so I will start. Missed first day of spring, positive or negative, cherry blossom looms. Lash to the forehead. Open processing meat plant. Start cotton picking. Lash to the forehead. Open processing meat plant. Start cotton picking. How is everybody doing? <laughs> Jail with corona. Thousand dollar bail money. Paper towel wipe. You all remember that paper towel churl? Mm -hmm. Jail with corona, $1,000 bail money, paper towel wipe. Bondage, forced to write. Haiku keep me from gasping, chewing, blacking pen. 10 days brick labor. Lumber, pothole, stopping pain. Paycheck, bounce, bounce twice. Just need sun moment. Swept up breadcrumbs, concrete floor. Share cornmeal, fish fry. Save by the haiku. Afraid, museum bedroom. What if bones are found? Hospital rooms, shrines, doctors, nurses wearing white. Final word, FaceTime. Careers changing, respiratory therapists, same. Nurses, undertaker. Stimulus action, social, social distance injustice, kick, whipped, cuff, then poof. Black, black blood on a white sheet, bird seasons, black birds only. Mother hand grief. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh.
Oh, boy. Murder on asphalt. Minnesota crush cockroach. Blood moth word mama. Murder on asphalt. Minnesota crush cockroach. Blood moth word mama. Terrorizing streets, white bodies on black bodies, bloody, bloody moon. Young black man jogging, two white men hunting. Blood sports, spring a trap, tree shots. This is a great book. This is a wonderful book. Christmas is coming up, Hanukkah. Um, get it for your friends and family. Okay, and I so happened to saw this anthology thing online and I submitted my Aiku and they accepted all of them. <laughs> so I'll read a few. Little black boy found Peter Pan in East New York. Why can't we stay kids? Sir, what did we do? Brown eyes meet blue eyes. Don't blink. Shot fired. Blurred eyes. Hmm. Bodies in the street dump without dump without bags, no ID, concrete burial. Face down, filled concrete, six year old mother, sister, cuff. Sunrise, sunset. Um, how am I doing on time? <laughs> I'll read a few more. Yeah, let's have a little fun in between here. Sex toys on the rise. Fuck. Why so expensive? I guess I have to stay dry. Um, um, dear Agent Virus, my Nana went to heaven. She forgot her hat. Delaware Crossing present day mega passage land instead of sea first day of school dad adjusts two year old mask he said ouch daddy no vaccine no fuck Go ahead, do your research, no heads, Google it. Death between smoke, moving like moon jellyfish, COVID stopped prancing. Plague world in labor, cervix dilate, water broke, mom swaddling stillbirth. Time, time. Go, one more. Okay. Oh, okay. Do this one. Blowing nose in mask, 
This is some nasty stink shit on friggin' five train. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, Right before COVID hit, uh, I got a grant from the Creative Capital Foundation uh, to start exploring ways in which, um, in which poetry and light uh, might work together. Is it very, are you hearing an echo? Or is that just me? You good? You good? All right. Uh, and so we've been, I've been experimenting with ways to get the poems from this book, the haiku from this book, uh, into different, uh, places and spaces but that use light. Uh, there's a streaming projection film that in August, uh, the Just Buffalo Literary Society projected them on these giant grain elevators along the Buffalo River at night as part of a program. Um, of course, the neon, which we'll get to in a second, the beautiful, gorgeous blue neon. Uh, but we, I also worked uh, with you know, two filmmakers, um, Shengji Zhu and Zheng Fan Yang. Uh, they run a company called Burn This Film. Uh, they have an incredible film out, by the way, that's touring festivals right now called The River Runs, Turns, Erases, Replaces. It was just reviewed in Art Forum uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, but they worked with another one of our members, Alando McIntyre, who will be reading as part of this program next week, to produce these uh, sh very short 10-second haiku films. Alando shot all the footage that's behind the letters. They were originally meant to be on the bus kiosks in New York City, uh, and that's why they're sized in this way. And we hope that that will still eventually happen, though it hasn't happened yet. So um, I think we're going to play these. Again, they'll run through twice, so everybody gets a chance to read them. Uh, created by Burn This Film with uh, footage shot by Worker Writer School member Alando McIntyre. Thank you. I love the idea of imagining those in those bus kiosks late at night in Manhattan, right, when you're on the bus or you're walking by and seeing them. So I really hope that, that we can make that happen. Uh, in case you're wondering about the, like, Lorraine has read a few of her poems twice and we showed this twice. It's a technique that we learned from the um, really great uh, Japanese translator Hiroaki Sato. Uh, he had a book uh, a couple years ago on New Directions Press called An Haiku. And when we did a workshop with him, he had told us the importance of reading it twice because the haiku has such impact, right? And I think one of the things that um, we hear in a lot of the poems, both from Lorraine in the book, from, we'll hear from Christine in a moment, is that one of the worker writer school models is simply 
to provide a really wide range of models for workers to write from, right? So Lorraine said all this really super positive things, which, you know, I'm, they are the ones who have been doing the writing. I am just throwing out a prompt. I have the easy job. But one of the things that uh, we try to do in the workshop for the haiku, for example, is read a really wide range of haiku. So we've read classical ha Japanese haiku, uh, Basho, others, right, Isa. We've looked at contemporary, uh, kind of post-industrial and industrial modern Japanese haiku. We've looked at and read with, at one point, Sonia Sanchez and the black arts movement use of haiku. Uh, Miri Baraka wrote this forum called the Lo Ku, C-O-U-P. Uh, which are his are, uh, drawings and short poems together. We had the poet Evie Shockley come and talk to us on Zoom about her st statistical haiku. So all of that, oh, the Japanese American internment camp haiku we read and studied. So we have uh, really kind of studied this form and I think it really comes across in the book and especially comes across in the poems uh, by our last poet today, Christine Yvette Lewis. Uh, Christine is a leader, organizer, and secretary cultural outreach coordinator with Domestic Workers United, uh, which, you, as you may know or maybe don't know, passed the very first Domestic Worker Bill of Rights in the United States. That's right. As a worker, leader, and multidisciplinary performance artist, Lewis has pulled from her Calypsonian roots and skills as a steel drum player, spoken word artist, and poet to get her message out and build power. For eight years, she's helped organize a partnership between DWU members and public theater, uh, public works productions of Shakespeare in the Park. She is the inaugural, very first, uh, and dearest among many dear members of the Worker Writer School. Christine Yvette Lewis. Hi all, how is everyone doing? Come on, come on, come on, lift your spirits. You know, we're in a cold moment. We talk about the coronavirus and we're in a dank moment. How is everyone doing? Oh, that seems, okay. So even that lifts my spirit. Thank you, Mark Nowak. Thank you, dear Beacon, for having us. Um, let me just say, my name is Christine Yvette Lewis, and it took me a long while to realize that my name is Christine Yvette for a reason. I was born on Christmas Eve day, and my parents taught to call me Chris Eve. So that's novel, and that's the word. And because, and during the, that saying, you know, as I say all of that, I say that to say, I love the word, and Domestic Workers United. I'm, I'm the, the Secretary, Cultural Outreach Coordinator of Domestic Workers United, the first group in New York City, in, in all the states, in New York City, to win a Bill of Rights to give protection to nannies, elder care keepers, and housekeepers. And that is commendable, because we were the little engine that could go into Albany for the past seven years for this Bill of Rights. It wasn't easy. Organizing is not easy work. Agitating lawmakers is not even easy work. It's not a walk in a park. But you know what? We did it. And doing it had set a precedent for other states to go after their very own Bill of Rights and get some wins too. So we're grateful. Mark, we're grateful to you for coming in. We talk about workers. We talk about labor laws, who are excluded from labor laws who are included and who are excluded. We talk about essential workers. We saw coronavirus in this dank season come and hit us, you know. I call it evil because I contracted it. Nobody could, I thought I wouldn't get coronavirus. I, I eat right, I exercise like nobody's business. I perform like nobody's business. And there goes the grace of God, it was I. Intubated twice, but you know what, I fight. I fight for workers' right, and I fought to live, and I'm standing right here right now. It wasn't easy. And when I talk about fight to live, I literally and figuratively fought to live. I had mittens on my hands that I swung at the nurses and doctors because I couldn't touch these tubes that was flowing from my body, and I had to fight. But while I'm fighting to live, 
I reckon uh, the, the disparity in the healthcare system. My partner in the, in the back there, who's sitting, he's also an artist. He fought to come into a space where he should not have been. He fought the security guard. He fought even the doctors who grow to love him because that determined whether I lived or died. Community, I say this essentially to say, with essential workers, with the pandemic, how important community is. And my community saved me. Hello. Hello. So I'm moved by all of this. Right now I'm standing here and I'm moved because from day to day, we must check in on each other. It's not you, myself, and I alone. It's all of us. Because, you know, it, it, it's, it's a season that inex is inexplicable. There's no word. It's, it's, it's just a pure evil. It's, it's taken... I'm, I'm, my friend goes into the hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, earlier this year, in January. Not in the heights of COVID. Everything was abating. And she goes in for a normal procedure. And thanks to Zoom in this season, you know, I, 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 am, I, I don't like technology much. I like movements. I like art. I feel we must be moving. We must be flowing, you know, the, like, like the ocean. We must be flowing. But she goes into the, the hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, in January. Goes in for a really simple procedure. Contracts COVID-19 in the hospital. Her family members couldn't even visit. And I'm looking at my friend with a ventilator in her mouth, dying on a hospital bed in Atlanta, Georgia in January. The doctor comes into the room, he sanitizes his hands, and he walk out. And I heard a simultaneous gasp from everybody's on Zoom saying, is that it? So we talk about the living, but we don't talk about the dying. And I knew that my friend Mary had no advocate, so she was just languishing and wasting away on a bed in Atlanta, Georgia. Again, we talk about the disparity, the inequity. Who could visit? Who couldn't visit? Who determines if we live or die? My partner there determined that I lived. Hello. That's a poem. That in itself is a poem. Because he fought with me. And I fought. I put on mittens and I fought. I went left, right, center. And I keep my eyes awake in the ICU. I had to. Because I don't think that the nurses and doctors knew what was really happening. And I'd read from my coronavirus haikus. And let me just say, the most demure and humblest person is my teacher, Mark. He doesn't like all these accolades, etc. But thank you, Mark. Thank you for, for, for providing us with the embryo to birth word. In the beginning was the word. And the word is essential. From the word, the word is a kernel. And from that kernel comes many things. We are all authors. We are all griots. We are all storytellers. Rats, human, vie for space on urban sidewalk. Cracks in tenement walls. Rats, human, vie for space on urban sidewalk. Cracks in tenement walls. Melancholy days, stench of death, pungent, linger, you haul for morgue. Melancholy days, stench of death, pungent, linger, you haul for morgue. Amidst naked shells, his lips stained with first milk shout, tear more mommy. Amidst naked shells, his lips stained with first milk, shout, Te amo, mami. Dismal season. Then I'm reminded, seed sprouts from cracks in concrete. Dismal season. Then I'm reminded, seeds sprout from cracks in concrete. Contrary days. Stress fingers penned, sad notes. Logged six, slippery treadmill. Contrary days. Stress fingers, pen sad notes, lugged six, slippery treadmill. Four blocks empty, a bitch tied to one wrist, summer madness on repeat. Four blocks empty, a bitch tied to one wrist, summer madness on repeat. She navigate folks in masks, subway, madam's room for less than 15. 
She navigates folks in masks, subway, madam's rooms for less than 15. Brown woman worn cold bench, intersection of dreams, a train below grown. Brown women worn cold bench, intersection of dreams, a train below grown. 5 a.m. dew, mist, robust rats, rake brittle bins, a silent cut, sit. 5 a.m. dew, mist, robot rats, rake brittle bins, a silent cat sit. Bangladeshi men deliver tacos, bitter days, Upper East Side. Bangladeshi men deliver tacos, bitter days, Upper East Side. November wind loot, listless leaves, boughs of ash, birch, a dog in heat pant. November wind loot, Listless leaves, boughs of ash, birch, a dog in heat pant. Balance, madam, home, dustpan, dust cloth, less than 50 now, American bread. Balance, madam, home, dustpan, dust cloth, less than 50 now, American bread. Hawk knitted caps, Mary Kay DKN, etched in hoodies, Daisy Dukes, pigeon its information, shit and broken leaves. Hawk knitted caps, Mary Kay, DKNY, etched in hoodies, Daisy Dukes, pigeons in formation, shit and broken leaves. North Station Plaza, above Frigid Railroad, 7 a.m. housekeepers huddle, Our Lady of Guadalupe amulet, hung from middle finger. North Station Plaza, above Frigid Railroad, 7 a.m. housekeepers huddle, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Amulet hung from middle finger. Grim me at mercy. I see you infused IV. Yearn for the good times. Grim me at mercy. I see you infused IV. Yearn for the good times. 30 days, needles, track worn vein, veins. Who's crimson at mercy? No mercy. 30 days, needles, track worn veins. Who's crimson? At mercy, no mercy. Innocent, innocent lips voice, who doesn't love me, right? That would be a mystery. Innocent lips voice, who doesn't love me, right? That would be a mystery. In dark of day, friends fall. Pen refused to scribe. Tears stain morbid paper. In dark of day, friends fall, pen refuse to scribe, tears stay in morbid paper. Thank you. So uh, now what we're going to do is open it up for a Q&A. Um, before we do that, one more time for both of our readers, Lorraine Garnett, Christine Yvette Lewis. Uh, does anyone have any questions for our readers? Yes. Um, it's the IQ itself is, is it really involved the five senses so I commute to, to work daily and the, the train is infested with inspiration <laughs> for haiku so sometimes it's really spontaneous you see something, it's an action and you just have to put it down when I started um, I would go in the train and like every other thing is like, what the fuck? But now I learn, okay, everything doesn't have to start with that. So I find other way. But it, it's, it, you, you're seeing, it's just so much stuff happening in the train. Thank you. Let me just say for myself, let me just say for myself um, 
Writing is not easy, especially to articulate your thoughts and um, articulate this thing in this moment. While it's five, seven, five syllables, and it seems simple, it's really not. So I, I pontificate around it. I let it, you know, kusumi or season or feel this thing that I'm relating that has to make sense in, in, in 17 words, right? So I, I have to let it embody me. This thing that I'm, I'm, like I'm laying in the hospital bed, right? And I'm looking at the, I'm thinking of the nurses who's taking care of me. I'm a caregiver, but the nurses who are taking care of me. Who has to work not just one job? They're leaving that job at Mercy and going to another job. And I'm looking at the ceiling because I'm yearning for art. I had to tell my partner, bring my steel drums. Because I, I forget I could even stand to walk to play the drums. But I'm looking at the ceiling and I'm saying, oh my God. These women are killing, cleaning the cracks of my behind. And doing it with such love. And I started to write. And I started to write. The, the haiku just came to me because I'm grateful. Yet, yet these women are going to another agency. Hello. We talk about essential work and who gets paid. They're going to another job to make ends meet. You know, we're having conversations to send their children to college. We talk about the immigrant story. Those women are immigrants trying to make it, trying to give their, their children the American dream, which is so elusive. It's a farce. We talk about milk and honey, but it's really a farce. So it's born from these places. I take a while to write. I, I really do. But when I write, it must evoke something in me. That when I read it, it evokes something in you. So it, for me, it's never easy. I write. I spend my time writing. It's, not a, it's like standing in the forest trying to fell the bird with this gun. And you're training it, the gun and the bird. And not forever the bird will fall. It's not a time to do it. So it's, it's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful um, form, the haikus. The really beautiful form that's, that evokes season. And we're going through seasons in our lives. But um, we do the best that we could to give birth to this thing. Thanks. I'm wondering if, um, as a follow-up, we have this beautiful neon of your haiku behind us. If you might read that and okay. tell us how you wrote that one okay. as a follow-up to, the, to the question. Thanks, Mac. Broken woman beg change. Sanitary napkin a first. Wall Street next. Broken woman beg change. Sanitary napkin a first. Wall Street next. You know, Lauren, I'd allude to what Lauren talked about. The train is a fodder for inspiration. It's a fodder. It's, you see the most unimaginable things happen, happening on the subway. And I'm sitting, you know, as Mark talked about us doing the coronavirus. And there's this woman comes on the train. And she's begging. She's begging a dollar, five dollar. Nobody wants penny anymore. They tell you what they want, right? Five dollars. <laughs> Which is funny, and they have attitude too. You know, I, I do what I could. But then she says, even a sanitary napkin will do. And we were coming into Wall Street, and I'm like, so sis, that, that was born right away. Because I couldn't imagine this woman having a need for sanitary napkin. And she was dead serious. And my bag is packed with everything except the kitchen sink. I carry my partner, ask me, why do I have to go with bags? I do. It's ritualistic. It's horrible. It's ritualistic because there's a bit of everything in that bag if somebody should ask. No, that's just one bag right there. There's another bag in the car. <laughs> yeah, but there's a bit of every. They don't understand the method to my madness. But when she said that, I was like, wow, a sanitary napkin. And she was dead serious. And I just looked up and I said, wow, I've heard it all. $5, $20, a glass of water, a drink of water, whatever, in the heights of coronavirus. So there was a need. And that came right away. I didn't struggle with that right away. Yep.
Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't hear so it. the oh. question, the question is, uh, reading the poem twice, do you learn new things in the second reading? Is there anything that surprised you that surprises you when you read the poem a second time? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just say, for emphasis, and yes, it's like writing it. I think. When I started to write, it was something about the three hours, right? You revisit, you review, and you rewrite. So yes, sometimes I go back in there, and I realize I miss the timing of, uh, I might have a little syllable more. I mean, we stay true to form, and it's okay to break the form. But I go back in there, and I say, oops, I, I went a little too far. And yes, it helps me review and reconnect with the word. And then it moves me, because we're speaking truth to power. It really moves me. You know, the, the, the word about, I'm, I'm listening to the news recently, again in the heights of the coronavirus, even this year, that there are so many rats in New York City. And I used to leave to go to work really early. And I'm thinking about the rat story. And there was a London report that said there was nine rats. Imagine a British report say there was nine rats to one person. That's terrible. And, and, and we're vis revisiting the news about a couple of weeks ago. And, and, and that has to do with, you know, I guess the sanitary, the, 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 the people who take some trash, we're eating out, and so there are more residues, so they're coming out. So yes, yeah, so revisiting this makes me realize how important it is to review, revisit, revise, because you could change, you could tweak. I'm afraid to retweak words because I feel it's like a seed gone out and I've sown the seed, but sometimes it needs a little tweaking. And I say, wow, you know. So yes, it's and for emphasis too. And to hear myself read it for the second time. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think originally when um, it was like instated for the Aiku to, um, to read, for you to read it twice, was really for the audience. Because it's such a, um, it's just three simple lines. And the and you know it could go by you within within no time, so it's for clarity for the audience um, for you to really hear because you know a lot of time it's on the second time you really get the true meaning the comprehension of the haiku. So I think um, that's it because it's it go by so fast. <laughs> yeah, it's three really lines, yeah. right? Yeah, and you could miss the meaning. You could really miss miss the intent of what's spoken here. You know, it's, it's deep stuff. And we don't want you all to miss anything. Yep. Yes. Yeah, it was for Christine's bio. So can I tell you that Calypso is what you call, it's, it's poetry too. And it's really social commentary on the island. So it's really a poem, a lyrical, a musical cadence of words of what's happening, coronavirus, what's happening. You know, like Sparrow sing about the Yankee dollar, working for the Yankee do dollar, Jean and Dinah, who, who were these prostitutes when the, the Americans came to the base to work on the roads in Trinidad long before I was born. But, you know, Sparrow would sing, Jean and Dinah, Rosita and Clementina, wrong the corner posing, bet your life is something they're selling. If you catch them broken, you could get them all for nothing. Don't make a row. The Yankees gone and Sparrow take over now. So it's social commentary. It's the extemporization as well. You know, I draw a verse, so it evokes that. So no, so we had done um, the tankers, which is kind of like an offshoot of the, which is, is five or four lines, right? The tankers, five lines, right? Almost with a refrain. I, I just like different forms of poetry. I do the, the sestina, I do the pantoums. You know, I, study, I studied um, different forms of poetry. So I do otherwise, but we're concentrating right now as the coronavirus hit. It's kind of easy, technical and interesting and challenging to come up with these three lines, kind of now. So it's really intriguing. 
but I, I do other aspects of um, other styles of poetry, but poems, you know, with easy rephrase as well. Yeah, and we have, you know, um, it's been 10 years for the Worker Writer School, so we, uh, that would be a long time with just the haiku. Uh, so we've actually looked at, um, we've looked at uh, poems, you know, I mean, the whole canon of poetry, everybody from Wallace Stevens to Mahmoud Darwish to Ernesto Cardinal. Uh, we did poems by Natalie Diaz and then went to see her read and she read with us at the New Eurekan Poets Cafe. We worked with Sonia Sanchez's poetry and then got to read with her at the Pen World Voices Festival. So it's been a, a long, uh, a kind of wonderful journey, you know, and um, one of the readers mentioned about uh, talking versus reading, and every time we get together in person, uh, <laughs> it's always so great because everybody talks and talks and talks forever, and I do have a kind of a, a famous saying about 20 minutes in that uh, if I had named this the Worker Talker School, we would all be doing great, but unfortunately I named it the Worker Writer School, and so take your pen, here's some paper, here's some tea, here's some fruit, let's start working on the poems. Lorraine, um, I know that Mark was saying that you've been writing a poem a day, uh, a haiku a day. Um, so I'm wondering, is what what do you find what do you find so engaging about the haiku? How has that form helped you kind of write and and develop? Uh, yeah, develop your artistic practice. Yeah, um, okay, this all the, started with the virus, the coronavirus. You know, I have to tell you, I was very fearful, like everyone, was, I was frightened. I mean, I was, I only went outside for essen essential, just food, just for food, and then I looked like an astronaut going out. I'm talking back in the early, you know, that early time in March, April and stuff. And we, I, I honestly was afraid to die. That was the first time I gave any serious thought to death. You know, because we're going about our business, we're working and, and um, going out with friends and stuff. But never really think, what if I should die? And I live in an apartment building, so... It's not, I couldn't go out in the backyard, you know, because if you live in, in elsewhere, you could go out in the backyard, get some air and stuff. So pretty much I was confined um, in my apartment. And um, writing was a way of relieving the pain, relieving all the sorrow. And then in my era in Brooklyn, and I'm sure, Christine, you hear it too, it, and other people were here, and it was sirens. In the morning, I, the siren, wake, it was my alarm clock, wake me up in the morning. And at night, my lullaby, but just with a pseudo lullaby because I couldn't go to sleep. So um, the haiku was a way of um, easing the pain. Thank you. I love that answer. For the audience, I'm wondering, in listening to the different haiku, if there were images that sparked something in you, if you have, like, what are, I'm curious for you all what you're thinking about and carrying with you. I mean, obviously we're in a museum and you see these works of art that are made by all sorts of materials, right? Uh, we have many more um, neon exhibits as well as exhibits that are made from various earth materials and uh, plywood, all of these different materials. I wonder what kinds what, what have you noticed in your own lives? What materials are standing out to you from the poems? What images are really speaking to you? Yeah. And could I tell you something? I was staying at my partner. I think just before I, I got sick. And I looked down on the ground and I saw a little, this was so emblematic, I saw a, a little plant growing out and I called him, I said, Rico, come and see this. And I actually take a picture because there was a seed 
of a plant growing out of the concrete. So hardship don't last. I mean, I went through it. You know, sometimes we say, why should I go through this thing? I went through it to realize that out of that dark and fired place becomes something so beautiful like the phoenix I rise. So amidst the hardship, there is always a growth. There's always a seed waiting to burst through the cracks in the concrete. And that's true. And I believe that. Because here it was, I mean, twice intubated. I'm looking at the doctors saying, what's going on? You all know what's going on? Feeling that I'll slip out into the other world. I felt it coming. I felt like everybody else. Because really, from March to now, I've known loss. I've known friends who have lost. Men and women of faith, deep faith, who believe Jesus will save. Nobody was exempted. So I'm, I'm laying on that bed, and that resurrects with me, that out of that hardship comes something so beauty. Because I, I couldn't walk. I had to learn to walk again. And I, one of the things I heard myself, I couldn't even play my steel drums. My fingers atrophied. My legs give up. As active as you see me walk across the street, in a twinkling of an eye, I, could, I had to learn to walk again. And I'm saying, my, look what I write about dismal season and cracks and, and things that come up in spite of all that we're going through. There goes the grace of God. It was me. So I could write my truth. So yes, out of dark always, there's always a sliver of light. And I believe it. I, don't, I, I live this truth and I believe that, that even in the midst of that, I saw life because I saw what death looks like. And by the way, it's not a bad thing. It's just that we are afraid to talk about it. We are afraid to embrace it and you know, what? What? No. It's a change. It's a ch listen, because it's a ch when we die to self, we die to habits. And we die. And we, and we, 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 we gain something. But because we're taught in our childhood to rever this thing, to fear this thing, I'm afraid of this thing, it's dark, it's dismal. It's not so. It's really not so. I learned this. Right, right. It's a change. To die is that we die to itself every day because we're morphing, we're changing, we're growing, we're evolving. That's a death. Okay. But I saw the depths of that. But I fought to come out from that space. And again, with us sitting in the room at Dear Beacon, how important community is. Because he fought as opposed to somebody who said we couldn't go up to that room. He fought. And did every, not my family members, because they didn't come. But he fought, as opposed to my friends, friend whose children were younger and couldn't fight. So out of that, out of the depths of, of the concrete, grows something fertile and beautiful. Answer your question. Okay. <laughs> yes. Oh. Lorraine found the poem. Uh, <laughs> she gets all the credit for it. You know, Lorraine was in a workshop of mine at the Brooklyn Public Library, uh, which is a separate workshop, uh, and she was writing these amazing things in the um, in that workshop, and uh, simultaneously, the Worker Writer School. Uh, Every year we participate in the Penn World Voices Festival. We've been collaborating with Penn America for 11 years now, um, doing our workshops in their offices and that. And so uh, we were doing a, an outdoor reading at the Farmer's Market, uh, the Union Square Farmer's Market. Uh, and I said to Lorraine, she had written a really great piece in the other workshop. I said, oh, you should come. I mean, I was very secretly like saying, you should come be part of this workshop. But I didn't say that. I just said, you should come read this one piece that you wrote with us at the Union Square Farmer's Market. So she came, she read, she met Christine, she met Seth and Davidson from the New York Taxi Workers Alliance and Healy from the Street Vendors Project and others, right? We work with a bunch of state worker centers in the city. and. Um, and then when the fall came around and we were starting again, I just 
sent a little email and said, oh, you know, we're starting up again for the year, and if you're interested, you might want to come. But she did all the work from there. That was, that was it. There's actually not a lot more to it than that. You know, to me, it's very different than, you know, when you teach a class in the university or college, right? You do a creative writing workshop. Like you, there's a, um, there's a hierarchization, right? There's like teacher, student. We're gonna drop knowledge down and correct it and say it needs to be this way or that way. Here, I think in the work of writer school, we, we use a much more horizontal model where like, I'll just come in with a couple of poems and say, what do you think about this? What does it inspire in you? And let's write something from there. So there's not a like, we're not offering our work for critique. The example is more like a, you know, I always use the example of like a Paulo Freirean uh, circle, right? And we're just in a circle in solidarity together and we're looking at some different models. We're looking at Sonia Sanchez, what do we think about this poem? We're looking at Evie Shockley's statistical haiku. We're looking at Jose's poems or uh, Natalie Diaz's poems, right? And saying, let's start from there. And so then everyone is just, it's a workshop of production rather than a workshop of critique, right? And so to us, that's been really important that it's just who wants to be involved in production? Like, the example I always use is, is uh, people in bands, right? Like if you're in a band and you put out your first record, right? You didn't go to school and take workshops to learn how to do that. You basically listen to a lot of records with your friends, right? And picked a couple things, like I like the way this guy plays guitar, we like the way that person plays drums. And you just get on stage a couple times at a bad bar and people don't really pay attention to you, <laughs> right? But if you keep producing and you keep doing it, and you keep listening to more records and a wider range of radio stations, right? And you keep doing that for, you know, four years, five years, 11 years. And that's just, you know, Christine was a poet before she came to us, right? But if you keep doing that for so many years, you're gonna get incredibly better, right? It's just, it's, we don't need someone saying like, change this line break, this word isn't working. I don't, that model doesn't work for me. So that is the way that it happened. And could I tell you, could I, so could I tell you, I came from a work of writers on Cliff in that, from 1994, and that was the model that, that Mark was talking about. That, that I wasn't an American, I'm, a, I'm from the island, I'm from Trinidad. And I felt sitting in that classroom that I had to write like an American. After, after using, after studying English poetry, I felt like I was rigid. And June, I, I go to poetry reading with Nikki Giovanni. And June Jordan says to me, and her parents, her, her father is of Bajan descent, Barbadian descent. And she said to me, listen to your voice. Pay attention to your voice. Use your voice. And from the time she said that to me, I started to flourish in my work. And I say that to, in, in relation to the question I asked Mark. We're so demure. We come in the space demure. But we've got it already. She's got it already. She just put it Yep. Um, I think that it is time for us to wrap up. Is that correct? It is. Um, I want to thank all of you so much for joining us, for uh, being here. I invite you to take pictures of uh, Christine's haiku to ask more questions, to get a copy of the book, Coronavirus Haiku, which is available at the shop. Um, please, y'all, one more time, can we please give your loudest round of applause for the poets and for Mark. Thank you so much, Dear Beacon, the staff, for having us. Thank you. And of course, give it up for Camila. So this is not the end of our, our engagement with the Worker Writers School. This is a one event and a series of readings that we're doing. So next week, Saturday, November 20th, 2 p.m. at Fish and Chicks, C-H-I-K-Z-Z -Z, in New Windsor, New York. We'll have another pair of poets from the Worker Writers School. 
to, pre to present. Then we take the following weekend as Thanksgiving, so we'll take that off. And then we'll be back on Saturday, December 4th in Kingston, just outside the Worker Justice Center of New York, where this work will go on long-term view for a few months. So, you know, head to diaart.org, RSVP, tell your friends, go buy the book, and maybe if you were inspired by different imagery in the galleries today or things that you heard, write your own haiku as well. So thank you so much for coming out and building this new community. Thank you.